Hello and welcome. I'm Kess Nida. I'm Professor of Computer Science at the University of Bristol. I'm really glad to be here today. I would like to thank the organisers for inviting me uh, to um, talk to you about whole systems energy transparency, a topic that I passionately care about. Um, I work in the computer science department of Woohoo! Let's have a look. What are we sharing? Is that any better? Is that any better? Yes. So, um, I work in the computer science department at Bristol and I lead the verification and validation for safety in robots research theme at the Bristol Robotics Lab as well as the Trustworthy Systems Laboratory uh, in Computer Science. Now, um, our research in Trustworthy Systems is focused on trustworthiness, and that means we are exploring and developing techniques that allow uh, system designers to uh, obtain the evidence that is required uh, for you to put trust into, this, into a system justifiably. Now we all know that trust can be um, gained and lost and is very hard to regain uh, once lost. Um, and so uh, we take the view that we are uh, working on trustworthiness, which should be demonstrable. Now trustworthiness can be demonstrated in very many different ways, um, including by design. If you make a system really simple, then you can, um, you can uh, understand it, and if you understand that system, then you may be able to put trust into it. One can also uh, demonstrate trustworthiness through rigorous uh, verification and validation. So some of our research is in this, and we're working on autonomous vehicles and um, robotics in particular. Um, but another technique to gain trust in a system is by knowing what it does through transparency. So transparency allows you to see how a system makes decisions and how a system uses resources. And it's exactly that which I would like to focus on today and tomorrow. So let me welcome you again. Um, it's great to be here and it's great to have so many of you um, in the audience. Let me see, I would like to, to start with, um, do a little poll um, to see what your background is. Um, I was thinking we could have a look at uh, your background. Uh, either you're from computer science, electronic engineering, uh, or, the, or computer systems engineering. And I was thinking computer systems engineering really is halfway computer science, sort of the bottom level of computer science, computer architects, um, and um, also includes electronics engineering, so VLSI design perhaps, and then some people from some other disciplines perhaps as well. And this will help me tailor this session. I would also like to know your skill levels. So are you considering yourself a software developer? I know many of us do research, but um, uh, the question really is, are you um, comfortable designing software? Um, would you consider yourself you know, someone who programs? Or are you more on the hardware side? So are you developing hardware? Uh, do you use RTL? Do you use Verilog, VHDL, uh, etc.? Uh, or are you one of those who is comfortable with both? And I also would like to know, in the context of energy transparency and energy generally, whether you care about climate, the environment and sustainability. Okay, um, let's see what um, comes out of this.
Okay, so it looks really, really interesting. Um, it looks really interesting. We've got 38% CSs, 30% EEs, 27 who are comfortable with both, 4% uh, others, skill more on the software side, 42%, um, hardware 11 and um, comfortable with both 47, which is great. Uh, let's see how we go with that uh, later on. And then there is lots of people caring about the environment. That is fantastic to see. Thank you very much indeed. I shall end this poll now and share the results. You can see it as we're going through. Um, can you see all of, can you see that? Make this bigger if I can. Okay, so that's fantastic. Um, thank you very much for participating and for engaging right at the first moment. Um, I shall stop sharing this, um, get rid of this, and we can carry on. Now, I'm sitting here in Bristol at the moment. You can see where Bristol is in the nice southwest of England. And um, I wanted to start with uh, a little bit about where I am, because today I'm in my office, thanks to you. Um, because the bandwidth here is much better than where I normally live. Um, so the University of Bristol uh, is not such an old university. Uh, it's been founded in 1909. And a little interesting fact about the University of Bristol, it's the first higher education institu institution in England who admitted women on an equal basis to men. And that's an interesting fact. It's one of Europe's top 30 universities. We've got six faculties about uh, 26,000 students. Computer science is part of the Faculty of Engineering and all this research that I'm presenting here and all the insights uh, have come from a curiosity that I developed from a verification background because really my, my background is uh, in verification, microelectronics design verification but now also branching out into robotics and autonomous systems and I consider a system equally flawed if it runs out of battery prematurely compared to it having a design flaw or an implementation flaw. So I wanted to know what happens if, um, if um, but I, I wanted really, I wanted to know how designers make sure systems don't do this, right? How designers make sure that their systems do not run out of battery and, and how energy is actually um, accounted for in the design process. Okay, and that um, started off a, a workshop series called ECO and a whole lot of research on what is called energy aware computing. Okay, so let's have a look as, as to what we want to do uh, today and tomorrow. I want to give you some introduction and motivation on energy consumption of computing. I would like to have a look at software uh, versus hardware. And I'm sure you've all seen the energy ratings on uh, white goods, where we have uh, ratings that go from A, uh, which is the most efficient level, to all the way down to G, which is the least efficient level. And um, when it comes to software and hardware, um, we kind of uh, think about systems from a system stack perspective where software is at the top and hardware is at the bottom of the stack. You can probably from textbooks or from your lectures have seen quite a few of these um, uh, system stack pictures with software at the top and hardware at the bottom. And if we do this for energy ratings, unfortunately, it's the case that um, we will have to turn our energy efficiency rating upside down um, and perhaps turn it round a bit. Um, because software tends to be far less energy efficient than hardware is, um, which is why it's so important to give power to software developers, which is also a subtitle of my talk. Um, lots of you have said um, there are from the software development, development side, and of course, who wouldn't want to have more power? And I claim that energy transparency uh, will give software developers more power to make sure the nice green bars go all the way up the system stack and don't just leave us at the bottom level of uh, the hierarchy. Uh, 
So we want to learn about energy transparency as a, um, a guiding principle. And we also want to learn how to measure the energy consumption of software. We want to learn about energy modeling. Um, so how to uh, characterize the energy consumption of identifiable entities during a computation. And we want to use these energy models uh, for static energy consumption analysis of software. Now that means we want to analyze the energy consumed by software, ideally without running it statically. Okay. Um, and we also will have a brief look at profile based energy consumption prediction. And we will also look at some research challenges uh, that arise and that are urgent for us to do in order to achieve our objective of making ICT greener. So uh, from that overview, the following learning objectives arise and they will, will, will be with us um, both today and also tomorrow. Um, so we want to learn why software is key to energy efficient computing what energy transparency mean and why we need energy transparency to achieve energy efficient computing, how to measure energy consumed by software, how to estimate the energy consumed by software without measuring it, so that is statically, um, how to construct energy consumption models, why timing and energy analysis differ, and why energy consumption should be promoted to a first class software design objective. Right. Now, we've all just had lunch, or many of us, at least those in Europe, I expect, will just have had lunch. And I've got the interesting task of making sure that you're kept awake. So I thought we're going to switch over to a video um, as an introduction and a motivation. So let me go over there and do a new share. I shall share the computer sound and I shall share this. Let's go for that. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, a video for you, a small video as a motivation. Every day, millions of electronic devices, phones, tablets, and computers are extensively used all around the world. And every day, millions of people are looking for electrical outlets, eager to recharge their battery. On the other hand, we all share the experience of large amounts of heat generated from our electronic appliances. Heat is wasted energy. We need a more efficient way of operating our computing and communicating devices. An ancient concept comes in useful. Energy is continuously available in the ambient. For example, solar power thermal energy and mechanical vibrations energy. Converting all this ambient energy into electrical energy is called energy harvesting. In fact, no different from what men have done for centuries with mills and water wheels, just on a very smaller scale. How much energy are we currently able to retrieve from ambient? Too little. Energy harvesting at present can barely power small sensors. There is still a gap between the energy needed for ICT devices to work and energy available from harvesting. ICT Energy brings together researchers working separately on those tasks with the aim of reducing this energy gap by increasing one level and reducing the other. In the near future, Huge quantities of wireless microsensors and transmitters will be distributed on objects and places, the Internet of Things. All these micro workers need energy, but they are too small to be powered in a traditional way. And there's more. The high performance computing strategy aims at producing the next generation of supercomputers. But those exascale computers are consuming a huge amount of energy. The solution is to reduce the energy wasted into heat. Less heat means more computing power. The ICT Energy Project aims to give a courageous answer to this challenge, enabling a new era for information and communication.
Okay, so hopefully, we can now go back. Are we seeing the right screen? Yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I wanted to show you this video because it nicely summarizes um, the challenge that we're facing in terms of energy consumption of computing. And um, I hope you enjoyed uh, watching it. And, and um, let's see whether we can now start looking at uh, the energy consumed when computing systems work. Because what we've just seen is, whether it's embedded systems, mobile devices, or the systems that, um, the large systems, just, yes, the large systems that um, are used to forecast the weather, uh, we know that uh, energy efficiency is the limiting factor in system design, right? In fact, energy has become the primary limiting, limiting factor in the development of almost all computing systems. That's um, possibly to do with uh, battery usage, so maybe these systems are using batteries, uh, or maybe it's to do with cooling that is necessary. And so really energy consumption is something that is at the forefront of our mind uh, almost all the time when we are uh, designing computing systems. Now, I'm sure you all have heard and um, seen uh, lots of opportunities to offset carbon footprint that uh, is associated with flying. Um, we know that flying is bad for the planet and um, it's interesting to um, know that the global aviation industry produces around 2% of all human induced carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so that's quite a large amount and um, we are at the moment collecting data to see whether it is actually um, uh, more sustainable to run the High Peak Summer School in the format we are doing it now compared to running it in a traditional way. And at the end um, of uh, these sessions, we will have a large amount of data, we'll analyze this and we'll find out um, what the result of this analysis will be. But getting back to flying, we all know that there are lots and lots of offers available to offset the carbon footprint uh, of flight. But have you ever had a, um, an offer to offset uh, the energy consumed by ICT? Um, I haven't had any of it so far, but research from 2018, so not very long ago, estimates the ICT sector's carbon footprint uh, is about 1.4% of the overall global emissions. So that's very, very high. And we are very concerned about aviation. Um, yet uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, much consideration when we ask Google for something, when we use uh, natural language processing, when we use AI. Um, so that's really, really important to realize that there is uh, environmental impacts from um, ICT and the ICT sector as a whole. Um, let's have a look, uh, for instance, at um, natural language processing. It's one of the things I mentioned. Uh, so we've got here Google Translate, we've got the English, we've got uh, Spanish, because I thought maybe um, the largest other language that might be spoken by the audience might be Spanish. Um, it's interesting if you look at, um, at natural language processing at the cost of natural language processing. There has been a paper that came out very recently um, last year where they for the first time estimated the carbon cost of training large AI models for natural language processing. Um, so if you look in comparison at the top of the slide we've got the consumption air travel one passenger between New York and San Francisco, human life average one year, American life uh, average one year, so a large amount more uh, CO2. Um, uh, um, emissions compared to uh, average and an average uh, lifetime of a car in including fuel um, there is also the foot the carbon footprint here or the carbon emissions now this research paper and I've got a link to archive the preprint on archive 
um, uh, made available down here. This is estimating the emissions from training common um, uh, natural language processing model compared to these everyday um, uh, benchmarks. And if we look at this uh, closely, we can see, for instance, that training simple models is actually reasonably um, uh, cheap. But when you add to it uh, tuning and experimentation, you easily get to seven times the uh, carbon footprint of a human uh, year. That's a lot, right? That's an awful lot. And if we go any further, um, then we can also look at this, for instance. Um, if we go to bigger models, uh, again, with uh, the neural architecture and full search, then you can easily outdo what a car spends over a lifetime by a factor of five, right? So there is an enormous cost associated uh, with the, the um, technological advances that we are currently seeing and that are making our life a lot easier. But the question really is, when you use them, do you really need to use them? Or can you find a different way that is possibly equally um, uh, good, equally fast? Um, and so we need to uh, become much more responsible in our use of technology and uh, be much more aware of uh, the cost uh, but of course, if this is not visible to you, then there is nothing you can do in terms of um, uh, changing your behavior. So it's really important that we have transparency and that um, these systems are effectively labeled so that we can see what the effect of using such systems might be. So I want to look also at um, global energy consumption or electricity consumption. And I've uh, got this data from uh, a yearbook. It's very recent data. And if you look at this, then we can see um, energy or electricity consumption uh, worldwide. And that gives an interesting picture. Uh, China at the top, the United States, India, Russia, uh, Japan, South Korea. Um, and it will be interesting for you possibly to uh, find out that the ICT sector uses 800 terawatt hours, okay, or 3.6% of the global electricity uh, to operate. And that would place the ICT sector somewhere between Japan and Korea in terms of its energy usage. That is rather large, okay? So that is uh, quite large, and that is data from 2015. I haven't found any um, concise data uh, since then, but that uh, won't have gone down significantly. And uh, that is really an interesting fact that we need to realize. Here's another interesting fact that I want to look at uh, with you, and that's the energy cost of AI. Uh, so in 2016, uh, Lee Sedol uh, was defeated by DeepMind's uh, AlphaGo, and that was a fantastic achievement for AI but how much energy did this cost? And it's interesting to work out um, what energy costs are involved for both the players. Uh, if we look at the human player, in a two hour match, the human player will have consumed around 170 kilocalories. Um, that's roughly the amount of energy that you'll find in a yogurt with honey and strawberries. Um, or I've been told this is about the power of a LED nightlight, about one watt, okay? So that's the human achievement. On the other hand, the same two hours for AlphaGo have consumed reportedly 50,000 times more energy. So 50 kilowatt, um, and so that is equivalent to having to have a generator here, so that's our light bulb for the human player, but that is um, a 50 kilowatt uh, generator that would be used for industrial lighting. And remember, that's only the play. Uh, what we haven't accounted for yet is the energy used to train that system, right? And so if you consider uh, that some leading uh, brain researchers and biochemists um, um, have 
stated that the brain works with only 20 watt, then there is a long, long way to go for us uh, to, to um, match the, uh, the performance that the human brain uh, is capable of in terms of uh, looking at energy and comparing that to AI. Okay, so I found that a really interesting uh, uh, fact. Okay, so we have those seen energy um, consumption improvements, um, and I'm sure you all realize that, that um, uh, the computing platforms we are using are becoming more and more energy efficient. However, Despite improved energy efficiency, energy consumption through electronic devices is predicted to triple because of a massive rise in overall demand. Okay, uh, so in just a few years, um, some uh, scenes can look very different, right? So if you look at St. Peter Square in 2005, um, that picture is um, what we perhaps would have expected. But if we're now looking at um, just a few years later, less than 10 years later, in fact, you will see this. And I'm sure um, this has gone up since then. So that's an interesting observation. It's our habits, it's our behavior. And there are officially more mobile devices than people in the world. And that has been the case since 2014. Right? So estimates at the moment are at about 19 billion electronic devices. Um, which is uh, calling for them to be more and more energy efficient, hopefully. And here is another example that's to do more with our uh, habits. Um, so Netflix, for instance, um, has quite large uh, carbon emission. So if you binge watch Netflix, um, it's not just not good for your health, but it's also uh, causing a lot of uh, energy consumption. Um, and, and our habits we should really watch and uh, be very mindful of. Now, I've seen that there are a lot of uh, social media users, um, and next time you, you, um, you feed that habit, maybe you want to consider uh, the energy consumed uh, by doing so. Maybe you want to consider the size of the pictures you're sending and thinking about making them a bit smaller. Um, and that will all contribute towards uh, making the world a better place. Okay, so let's have a look at energy aware computing as a whole and um, uh, start our investigation into energy aware computing. Um, one of the first things I've seen when I started in this in this area is this sort of call, right? As you see in this in this um, in this uh, screenshot, that's quite an old one from 2012. Free mobile apps train batteries faster. Um, app makers must take energy optimization more seriously. Now, if you consider yourself a software developer, it tends to be quite hard. Uh, to understand how much energy is consumed by the apps you write. Um, and that's what motivated us to look into energy aware computing. Okay, so before we dive deeper into the hardware side of things, I think we've gone for about 28 minutes. I'd quite like to have a look at some of the questions uh, that have come in. Um, Yes, so someone wanted to know about energy efficiency and carbon footprint. There's closely related links between the two. Some people um, can see um, the, you know, can associate more with the energy consumption. Some people can more, more associate with the carbon footprint. I just wanted to offer a variety um, of, of, um, of options here. If the internet would have been a country, it would be the third largest energy consumer in the world, learned at earlier uh, summer, summer school. Is this true? Um, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, I'm, uh, I have renewed my slides. I have 
replace the slide that you have seen. Let me just go back uh, to that. I quite like to go backwards. So if I go back to that slide that you're referring to, this is the one. Um, then the old slide that I had, um, had data from 2007, and that placed ICT fifth in the world. Okay. Um, and yesterday, I actually looked this up with more recent data. You can see up here, this data is from 2019. And um, the, the um, energy consumption data is from 2015. I haven't found any better. So that would place uh, ICD um, one, two, three, four, five, sixths in the list, right? Um, if anyone has any better data on the overall energy consumption of the ICT sector, then please let me know. I'd be grateful uh, for any updates and then we can see where that would place uh, ICT if it was a country. Okay. Thanks for the questions. Okay, so let's move forward again. Looked at this, we've also had a look at that. And now let's move on to energy efficiency of ICT. So I would like to start from the bottom of the system stack, that's gates, um, uh, units, blocks, and the architecture. Now, many of us know that low power has been the focus for hardware developers for more than a decade, and they have been extremely successful at it. Okay, so there is um, lots of evidence and I have seen a very inspiring talk by uh, Steve Ferber and I would like to follow in his footsteps to have a go at looking uh, uh, or giving you a historical perspective on how computing has evolved and how we got to where we are now. Okay, the first modern computer um, was the baby which um, was built in 1948. It filled a medium-sized room and executed 700 instructions per second. It had three-bit instruction encoding, 32-bit word length, and the memory of 32 words. Okay. Um, the photo that you see here is a replica that was built for the 50th anniversary um, uh, and is now sat in a museum um, so this is not an original, okay? Now, in comparison, if we look at an ARM architecture from 2005, um, we can see this here. There it is. It's tiny. It fills 0.4 square millimeter of silicon, right? So what I want you to do is take your fingernail and have a good look at it. 0.4 millimeter square is really, really tiny, right? So that would just about be like a pin on your fingernail. That's how small that would be. Now, if we zoom in, we basically find it here. It sat on a board that is four millimeter by 2.5 millimeter. And in there, the green uh, uh, rectangle, that's the processor that I'm talking about. It executes 200 million instructions per second, right? So that is a large number of instructions um, to uh, execute per second. And it is therefore um, 300,000 times, um, that's 300,000 times more than the baby computer that we've looked at before, which was um, one of the first computer that existed. Okay, so we have come a long way. 60 years of progress. The baby filled a medium sized room, used 3.5 kilowatt of electrical power in order to execute 700 instructions per second. Okay. In 2005, um, an ARM architecture, uh, much, much smaller, 
the 0.4 square millimeter of silicon um, you get on a 130 nanometer process, uses 20 milliwatt of electrical power and executes 200 million instructions per second. So if we look at the energy efficiency, we get the baby at five joules per instruction and the arm at 100 picojoules per instruction. Now, if we write this out, then that's how many joules that is. So that's a large number of zeros. And uh, that basically means uh, the ratio of these two numbers is over um, 2 billion. It's in fact 50 billion. Now, a billion is a large number. Uh, it's so large, in fact, that many of us can't imagine what that actually means. And so Steve Ferber, when he gave this talk uh, at Bristol, used a very nice um, analogy, which I would like to share with you. So what he said was that if cars had improved by a similar ratio in their fuel efficiency, a few gallons of petrol would be enough to keep the UK mobile and the oil crisis would be forgotten um, at the time. Okay, so that basically means um, there is a large efficiency gain in computing since we started off. Of course, there are good reasons why cars cannot achieve such levels of fuel efficiency, right? Whereas there is no lower limit to the fuel efficiency of computing, in theory, it can be done with no energy at all. And we are far from that. Okay, so you might say, well, okay, that's 10, that's 2005, we are in 2020 now. Let's have a look at uh, some other data that I managed to get from 2015. Uh, in comparison, uh, we've got uh, a little bit smaller, smallest, uh, the smallest area configuration for the Cortex A35 is less than 0.25 square millimeters, uses less than four milliwatt of electrical power, um, and executes 210 million instructions per second, right? So advances have been made, but they're not as big in terms of the instructions per second, but in terms of the electrical power, that has gone down quite a bit. So as I said, hardware design is actually at the forefront. Um, hardware designers have had low power on their agenda for a very long time. They have developed all sorts of interesting features in hardware to save energy and to arrive at these fantastic results. Uh, there's power man management, um, which is in the hardware domain that you can access with considerations given to minimize or optimize the switching power and also the leakage power in circuits. And there are a large number of on-chip power management uh, options for, different, for instance, different modes, standby, suspend, sleep, off, etc. From a verification engineer's perspective, that gives me a nightmare because not only um, is it hard to verify um, complex processes, but now, thanks to the on-chip power management, we also have to verify that they're doing the right thing when they're in standby, suspend, sleep, off, on, and when they're transitioning between those. So um, it makes that aspect much more complex, but on the other hand, um, it has significantly uh, improved the uh, energy consumed by the hardware components. So, so development of low power electronics um, has obviously been very successful but the question really is where can the greatest savings be made and i saw this interesting um, uh, slide in a presentation where someone said well the greatest save savings can be achieved uh, at the higher levels of abstraction and they gave exactly this uh, picture so at the bottom, you've got layout and gate and RTL synthesis, which are clearly hardware. And then you've got the architectural layer. And the justification was that actually the architecture knows how it's going to use the hardware. So that is where you've got the largest optimization potential. But hang on, as a computer scientist, I know that the system stack doesn't stop at the architecture level right? The system stack goes far beyond that. There's all the software stack on top of that. 
And so from this, we take that the greater savings can be obtained at the higher levels of abstraction. Now, when I started off in this to work in this area, um, there, I, I found this interesting um, article in the Electronics Weekly. Okay, um, and it is interesting because it was entitled "Lack of Software Support Marks the Low Power Scorecard at DAC." DAC is the Design Automation Conference, so important for design automation uh, for hardware designers and also for verification. And I'd quite like to talk you through this article because it is so inspiring. So what it says is, if the software keeps cores active for no good reason, the lower switching power per bit process won't deliver the realized saving. Right? So the software is actually burning energy uh, for no good reason. Someone from Intel said that with limited software support, dedicated low power circuitry could save maybe 20% in a typical multimedia core. If we make the software controlling uh, such a computation better at controlling the power states, that difference could be three to five times. Um, so a lot of savings could be made if the software was actually uh, power aware, right? Here is an interesting question. The question is whether we can take the actual use cases into consideration and optimize the software, the power, the logic circuits down. We still have a long way to go. Notice the we there, right? So this is um, this is at the Design Automation Conference. This we sounds to me as if it's including everyone in the community. But here is uh, where they basically give the challenge away. We should put a challenge to the software designers to see how much power they can save. That challenge has been there since 2011. Have we taken it up as computer scientists? Um, we probably didn't even know that they were talking about it at the time. Okay, so there is a long way to go and that is really a challenge that we should face uh, because software has a large part to play. So in conclusion from this little, uh, this curse, um, hmm. what happened? Still sharing? Let's have a look how far did we get. Yes, so we're back. Sorry about this. Right, so there is a lot of wasted potential. Um, whilst the hardware designers have made huge advance advances, uh, the potential energy savings are wasted often by software that doesn't exploit energy saving features of hardware and that poorly manages uh, tasks and resources at runtime. That is a problem and that is something we need to address. So if we now move further up, uh, we've looked at the bottom level, gates, blocks, architecture, then going to drivers, compilers, software and algorithms. Unfortunately, at the moment, software doesn't do a good job. Uh, the potential energy savings enabled by low power hardware are often wasted by software that doesn't exploit them. But software controls the behavior of the hardware. And that means algorithms and data flow and compilers. Um, now, compilers are contributing towards optimizations. However, the traditional software design goals are typically performance, 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 right? And that is a bit of a problem um, because uh, software engineers tend to be blissfully unaware of the implications that algorithms, code, and data have on power and energy consumption. Power and energy considerations are at best second-class second design goals. But we have just learned that the biggest savings can be gained from optimizations at the higher levels of the abstraction stack um, or of the abstraction in the system stack. And that includes algorithms, data, and also software. Now, when I started researching in this area, um, I uh, found a lot of papers that 
could obtain like 2% of saving here, 3% here. Um, and we're specific for certain architectures, for certain setups, um, and for certain uh, application areas. And I wondered whether there was something that is more generic, that is more uh, warranting academic research than a point solution. And I found an interesting paper that I would like to share with you. This paper was entitled Software Design for Low Power. And I thought, yeah, exactly. That's what I want to know about. And um, I recommend reading this um, to anyone who is interested in low power software. A paper that starts like this is an entertaining read. Let me start reading it for you. It is tempting to suppose that only hardware dissipates power, not software. However, that would be analogous to postulating that only automobiles burn gasoline, not people. Yeah, so poor software is like a poor driver. Um, and so uh, not only is this paper interesting at the start, but it also um, has a very interesting end. Okay. The end of this paper verbatim gives uh, key steps for aligning software design decisions with energy efficiency as a design goal. And that's verbatim from the paper. Um, let's uh, go for it. Um, the key steps include choosing the best algorithm for the problem at hand. So now I've prepared a poll. Let me see. And I would quite like to know whether you do this or not. So when you develop software, you choose the best algorithm for the problem at hand. This is intended to be for software developers only, those who have said, you know, I'm, I'm more on the software side. Do you choose the best algorithm at hand? Anyone who's just on the hardware side, let the software developers say what they want to say um, and watch what happens. Okay, so let's have a look at the result of this. You can see uh, quite clearly there's a large number of people who say, yes, um, I choose the best algorithm for the problem at hand. Well done, that's what we would expect. Um, now, uh, the paper doesn't just stop there, uh, it goes further. And I make sure it fits well with the computational hardware. Okay, so uh, let me ask again. Um, again, software developers only. When I develop software, I make sure the algorithm that I've chosen, which is the best one uh, at hand, fits well with the computational hardware. Okay, thank you very much. Interesting and insightful. Uh, let me share that result. There's actually quite a large number uh, of you who are making sure that their algorithm is not just the best for the problem at hand, but fits well to the computational hardware. I'd be quite interested in how you do that. So perhaps you can put this um, uh, into the chat box or so. I'd be interested on in what basis you actually do this. Um, the reason why I was interested in this poll is that there is a penalty for not doing this. And in many classes or in many um, uh, presentations that I do, when I say we choose the best algorithm for the problem at hand and make sure it fits well with the computational hardware, people don't really understand how they should do this. 
um, because for decades we have moved software engineering as far away as we can from how the hardware works. In fact, it is now possible to write programs without having any idea at all how they will be executed. Uh, now, uh, the levels of abstractions that have uh, enabled this are good in the sense that you can write quite complex programs without knowing how they're being executed and um, you know you have increased uh, uh, portability of programs you have increased programmer productivity and you have software reuse across hardware platforms but the clear drawback from this is that many software engineers don't understand how things are executed and there is a little warning here that says failure to do this can lead to costs far exceeding the benefit of more localized power optimizations. Right? This is really where we need um, to start if we want to have energy efficient uh, software. Then the next step is to minimize memory size and expensive uh, memory access through algorithm transformations, efficient mapping of data into memory and optimal use of memory bandwidth, registers and cache. No surprise there. Memory is expensive or going to memory is expensive. We optimize the performance of the application, making sure that we have used parallelism well. Then we take advantage of hardware support for power management, and that's all the different features, um, the different standby modes, on, off, etc. And finally, we select instructions, sequence them, and order operations in a way that minimizes switching in the CPU and data path. Right, now normally I would ask, how old or young do you think this paper is? But um, that's a bit awkward in this case. So let me show you. This is a paper from 1997. Okay, so we have known this for a very, very long time. And okay, at that time, there wasn't uh, many cores, um, etc. around. Uh, so so the challenge at that time was a bit different compared to the challenge we are now facing. But the fundamental principles are still the same. And you can see this also if you look at more recent uh, 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 publications. Uh, this one is more recent than 1997. It's from February 2010. Uh, that's from Steve Ferber. And he was asked about um, uh, energy consumption of computing with a focus on hardware but also looking at software and his answer was if you want an ultimate low power system then you have to worry about energy usage at every level under system design and you have to get it right from top to bottom because any level at which you get it wrong is going to lose you perhaps an order of magnitude in terms of power efficiency. Um, I leave the full thing for you to read at your leisure. The question really is, do programmers have an understanding of how much energy their algorithms consume? Um, as a programmer, we cannot afford to be ignorant about the energy costs of the programs we write. And really what we need is tools that give feedback to developers to tell us how good our decisions are so that we get a better understanding of what the code is doing in terms of using up the resources on the planet okay so this is really uh, an important challenge so the question is how much there is no way i can optimize unless i know how much um, things cost which leads me to the concept of energy transparency right we've got it one o'clock here, two o'clock on your end. I wonder whether this might be a good time to have a look at some questions. Um, let me have a look um, to see what there is at the moment. Yes, I agree. There is a, a statement here. Some software runs on virtual hardware that changes the uh, power picture significantly, that's true. That makes it even more difficult in some cases uh, to gain an insight as to how much might be consumed. Yeah, 
interesting uh, uh, statement and and uh, and question from Jasmine. If it is for the embedded systems, yes, we can reason about optimization for the computation and memory. If it is for a general purpose machine, is that even possible? Well, it is possible, uh, but it is a lot harder. So that is why in our research, we have focused to start with on embedded systems and actually very, very simple embedded systems to start with. Uh, but it is certainly possible to do something about general purpose computers and even uh, HPC systems. Um, the, um, the question from Davida, um, in terms of, in theory, it should be possible to compute without consuming energy at all. Um, I will answer in writing. Um, and I will point you to some resources that give you an insight into the physics. And um, that is where the answer to that question is anchored. Okay, um, those longer questions I will answer uh, uh, in writing um, the question from Kim or the questions from Kim. Okay, so before we have a slightly longer break, I want to move on to the principle of energy transparency and introduce this as a general principle. Um, so energy transparency means that information and energy usage is available for programs, ideally without you having to execute them. And at all levels from machine code to high level application code. So that um, tools can understand how much energy is consumed and possibly generate different machine code. But also as a developer, ideally I want to have an editor. I want an editor that shows me the parts of uh, the code that I'm writing that are green and those that are energy hungry, which are possibly highlighted in red or orange. Okay, so that's ideally what we mean by energy transparency, a way of understanding what you're writing in terms of its resource usage uh, with a focus on energy. So we know that the principle of transparency works in other areas of life, right? So for instance, we know that uh, food is labeled uh, with uh, the calories uh, and the ingredients um, and the nutritional values. We buy white goods in terms of these energy ratings. And also, um, I've seen a very interesting uh, backside of a train ticket in Italy that shows um, the CO2 footprint uh, of different modes of transport to different destinations. And I found this interesting because really, we don't just want a single value like you find on the pizza, right? Uh, you want an energy consumption function. So a function that is uh, parameterized by maybe the size of the input data that tells you if you call this with a data size of that, um, um, you know, with this data size, then uh, this is the energy consumed as a function over the size of the data. Okay, so that's what we really ideally want to have, not just point solutions, but energy consumption functions. So, Energy transparency enables um, a deeper understanding of how algorithms and coding impact on energy consumption of a, of a computation when executed on hardware. And this is exactly why we need energy transparency, because uh, we want to understand uh, what impact the choices we are making ha um, has on um, the software and the systems we create. Okay, so we're getting very close to a break. In fact, this is now the time when we will have it. Um, I wanna come before we have our break to the learning objectives. We set out 
to see why software is key to energy efficient computing and what energy transparency means and why we need energy transparency to achieve energy efficient computing. And I hope we have achieved this. What we will do next is we will look at measuring the energy consumption uh, uh, of software. Now at this point in time, I need to stop sharing because I was thinking um, this is now the afternoon, you've all eaten, you've listened for an hour, you've sat on your chairs and I thought it would be a good idea to get you up, uh, to get you up more so than just going to the bathroom. Um, and to achieve this, I was proposing a scavenger hunt. I don't know whether you've participated in a scavenger hunt before. Um, uh, NU has the slides for our scavenger hunt. And I would like to go back up in order to let him share. Any, can you share this? Yes. Okay, so we've got the scavenger hunt uh, on the slides. That's brilliant. Um, so a scavenger hunt is basically asking you to um, get up and uh, get a few items. What we would like you to do is we want you to find the following eight items um, in wherever location you are, a plant, a cuddly toy, a local drink, a watch or a clock, a roll of toilet paper, a piece of local fruit, sunglasses or a sun hat, something typical or traditional for your country. Um, take a picture of all these items together and submit it to, I can't see the link, but I'm sure you must see it. Um, there is a link at the bottom and any you will also have put it into the chat. There is a link there. Um, you have about 10 to 12 minutes to do so. And I hope this is more enjoyable for you than just um, having a break without a scavenger hunt. Uh, participate, we'll have a gallery afterwards. Um, the there are prizes to be won. Uh, there are prizes for uh, the first few submissions, but there is also a prize for the most original submission as well as a prize for a criterion that is more course specific. Off you go. We are looking forward to your pictures.
Okay, so I have I have heard that we've got a good collection of pictures that have come in. Uh, thank you for this. Um, we've got about fifteen to twenty uh, submissions. Um, our uh, technical support will um, put these all together for us in the gallery and uh, we will announce uh, winners tomorrow in tomorrow's session. Thank you very much. I hope you had a lot of fun doing this and uh, tomorrow we will have a look at um, the outcome. Um, right, and I hope this has got you out of your chair um, in order to do something that is um, uh, also getting your, your, uh, your circulation going rather than just uh, sitting. Okay, now I need to share the screen again. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Right. So, um, have we got further questions that I would like to look at? Uh, hardware for system programming languages create a high level of abstraction that allow many people to code. If those developers would like to develop energy efficient, they would need to understand those layers first, which is not feasible. Offered so I would say, do you think is it possible to write more energy efficient code without that knowledge? So, uh, Jacob has uh, uh, written a really interesting uh, question, a question that is core to the research um, we are conducting here at Bristol. Uh, Jacob uh, pointed out that hardware, operating systems and programming languages create high levels of abstraction to allow many people to code without knowing all of those layers in detail. Uh, that's certainly the case. Um, uh, there are in fact many who do. Um, and that's giving them great power, but with great power also comes great responsibility. Um, and unfortunately, all these layers have uh, contributed greatly to obfuscating uh, what uh, we are now trying to bridge using this um, this principle of energy transparency. Um, it would be so much easier for people to learn about the energy consumed by the code they write if they had um, opportunities to understand uh, the resource usage of the programs they write. Now this is really really hard because uh, sometimes you don't even know on what hardware uh, you are your code might be executed. So this is a huge challenge, uh, but one that we should be uh, looking into uh, because the more we can support this, uh, the better. So if we start with embedded platforms, uh, for instance, Raspberry Pis, right? Raspberry Pis could easily um, be turned into what I'm calling a gooseberry pie by um, allowing developers see how much energy is being consumed by the code they write and run on a Raspberry Pi. And that is a worthwhile target uh, for a, a first go. Uh, but it is a large challenge. Um, Jacob, very many thanks for your question. Okay, back to our learning objectives. What we wanted to learn is how to measure the energy consumed by software. Um, so, Let's dive right into this. What you see there is an energy measuring board. Okay, that's an energy measuring board that we have developed here at the University of Bristol. The first step towards energy transparency is being able to measure. Okay, and uh, that's what we're diving into now. So, we've got um, the processor that we want to measure. And uh, into the power supply of that processor, we need to put a shunt resistor. And um, then uh, we measure the voltage drop across that resistor to find the current. And we measure the voltage at um, each side of the resistor, and that allows us to calculate the power. Uh, inside there, we've got an analog to digital converter in that power monitor there, we've got an analog to digital converter. And what you would be able to see if you looked inside there is the signals are coming in and then uh, on, uh, uh, are amplified. And on the other side, you get your uh, measurements. Now, if you repeat this frequently, timestamp each sample and do this very often, you get power samples over time. And if you then integrate over these, you get the energy. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit of an introduction to this. Uh, but what's the showstopper here? And in one of the earlier polls, I asked um, uh, who is coming from the software side and who is coming from the hardware side. Um, and at this stage, I'd quite like to pull another poll, um, the one on soldering. So let's have a look. What I'd like to know is how many of you are comfortable soldering and out of those who are comfortable soldering, how many are from the software side? Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much. That looks like a really interesting result. Um, and that, that's very, very nice. Um, let me share this. Um, we've got quite a lot of you being comfortable soldering and more so those come from the software side or there's a large number uh, coming from the software side. Uh, that's really nice to see because what we have found uh, in the past is that actually um, that is a showstopper, right? It's a showstopper because many people um, in the software side find this rather difficult um, and would rather not take a soldering iron to a piece of hardware that um, looks perhaps a bit like, like this, okay? Um, so while soldering is easy, it's typically not part of a um, computer science degree um, and also not uh, part of a software engineering class. And so that tends to be a showstopper uh, for um, other audiences. And so as, for that reason, we have developed a open energy measurement board to bridge exactly this gap. Um, you can download the um, schematics for this board from magic.org. Uh, and uh, this board has been designed by a colleague, um, Simon Hollis at the University of Bristol. It's an add-on for the STM32F4 Discovery Development Board from at ST Microelectronics. So I've got one of these boards here. That's how it looks like. It's a shield basically that sits on top of, and I've got one put together here, the STM32F4 Discovery Board. And you can see the shield here, that's the power uh, measurement uh, shield. And you can see it also in the slide there. And underneath you've got the board that hosts uh, the power measurement shield. Now, if this would have been a physical summer school, we would actually have had a go at this and uh, measure a few targets. But as it is not, we will not do this. Um, the board uses uh, uh, the 12-bit analog to digital converters of the discovery board to convert the measurements to digital values. Um, there are, let me just go one further back. Um, if we look at this board more closely, there are different resistors that you can use. Um, there is a 5 ohm resistor and then it goes down along this line uh, to a very small resistor down here. And for those that are uh, happy to solder, you can actually put your own user resistor at the far left of this uh, measuring point or this channel. The board offers three channels to measure, um, one here, one at the top right and one at the bottom right. So you can actually poke a board, a target board, uh, and measure the energy consumed by that board during computation with three um, channels or at three points. Okay, so you can see this here again. It basically sits on top of this discovery board and um, you might ask the question, how much data uh, can you get? Um, we can currently, uh, we're using it for three channels, um, each 50k samples per second, right? So that gives us uh, three channels fully synchronized and that allows us to get a good picture of what's going on on the target circuit. Uh, theoretically, it's possible to go in bursts of a far higher sampling rate, uh, but that is at the cost of uh, accuracy. So we are at the moment sampling at um, the 50K per channel for three channels. Okay, so how does this work? We've got our um, energy measurement board. That's the discovery board. That's the one that I've shown here. That's the big one here. And on top of this, you've got the energy shield, which is basi basically just clipped on top. Um, and that allows us uh, access to the resistors that I've shown in the previous uh, slide. So the resistors are effectively available from these pins there 
that's where the resistors are available. And what you can see here is that we have access on this board on the right hand side. We've got access to the power supply of the um, of the processor. And in this particular case, we have a Cortex M0, an ARM Cortex M0 development board, and we want to know how much energy is consumed uh, whilst this Cortex M0 is running. Okay, and so this here is connected to one of these resistors, and that allows us to measure how much energy is being consumed by the board. Okay, and here is another setup uh, where we again are measuring uh, or using the shield. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see the ST Discovery board together with um, the shield sat on top of it. Um, and there you can see that one of the channels is connected to um, the nuclear board in order to measure power of this device as well. Okay, so uh, if it was, would have been physical, we would have tried a few things and I would have probably invited you to bring your own targets uh, to do some measurements. It's actually quite simple. You can find all the information of the board and how to use it, including access to the software um, online on magic.org. Magic stands for Machine Guided Energy Efficient Computing and um, you can find all the information there. Okay, just to summarize, we can effectively directly measure the energy consumed during the execution of a program as long as we have um, the hardware to do so and as long as we have access to those points at which we can intercept um, the circuitry. The accuracy of the measurements depends on the sampling frequency, on the measuring hardware, on how good the hardware is that you use, and on the characteristics of the target you want to measure. Um, and in many cases, specialized hardware and or modifications to hardware, unfortunately, are still required to enable such energy measurement. Okay. Um, uh, but if you want to um, have a look at the magic.org website and familiarize yourself with this and use the uh, energy shield uh, or manufacture your own, you're absolutely free to do so. Okay. Right. Now we said we would look at energy measurement and monitoring and uh, for desktop applications that can be much more of a challenge. Um, this is actually quite easy to do with embedded development boards for a desktop um, uh, system. This is not so easy. So I had a set of uh, students uh, second year students in this case, who were wanting to know how different algorithms compare uh, with each other in terms of energy consumption. Um, but what they found is there wasn't an easy way of doing this. And instead, what they first did is to develop a simple energy aware computing framework to obtain exactly the right uh, values so that they could then start comparing algorithms with each other. They called it ECOF and it's on GitHub. You can look at it and you can contribute to it if you want. We used um, uh, a provider based on the Intel Power Gadget API uh, with a resolution of 20 milliseconds to measure the energy usage of um, the CPU in joules. Um, so let's have a look how they uh, went about this. So from a high level, from the provider, uh, the energy data provider effectively, or uh, the energy consumption data um, that came from uh, uh, the hardware or is consumed by the hardware, the operating system. You have an ECOF, a central authority that then uh, communicates with consumers. On the provider side, you've got, um, for instance, the CPU consuming um, uh, power, the battery, and also hard drives or so. So there are different types of uh, consume, uh, uh, providers that uh, you can measure the energy for. The central authority then uh, relates this to the consumers. So you might have an email client, a video player, a web browser, and that's where you want to have the energy consumption for. Okay. Um, you can have this running on one machine and you can also have it networked uh, there might be some uh, uh, energy consumed by the network, but at lo as long as uh, you have uh, a, a way of measuring it through the uh, energy 
data providers, it is possible for the uh, central authority to relay that information to the respective clients. Okay, so how do you use this? What does that mean as a software developer? Why? Right. Let's have a look at a very simple provider example. So um, we will look at um, this piece of code um, for a simple provider. So that's sitting in a loop and collects the energy data um, as it sits there. Okay. We then uh, include the ECOF uh, infrastructure and we instrument this. So there's a header file, we define some probes, we define some samples, we create a probe, um, for instance, uh, for the battery usage. And then as we collect the energy consumption data, we put that data into um, the probe. We, we basically put that data uh, to the samples associated with the probe. Okay. And so that basically means we're collecting all the data as the device is active. And that allows us then to uh, uh, relay that information to any of the consumers uh, that have initiated the activity. On the consumer side, we've got our consumer code. So that is the code that you write as a software developer. And uh, that's just a simple for loop here. And now we have to instrument this. So we are including a header file, we are including um, uh, uh, checkpoints, so I know when I want to measure the energy, and then again I have to have samples, we initialize things, and then um, I have my for loop uh, sandwiched effectively in the ECOF uh, instrumentation, and each time I go through my for loop, um, I sample the checkpoint, and uh, that basically means I collect the energy consumed as my for loop is running. Okay. Uh, the API of the ECOF offers you the creation of probes, deletion of probes, activation, deactivation, adding the samples as we've seen, uh, setting checkpoints, sampling these checkpoints for the energy consumption, and then deleting the checkpoints again um, to get rid of uh, the, the uh, collection. Okay. So that uh, instrumentation has allowed the second year, this group of second year students to then investigate features of algorithms. Okay, so if we look at this um, more closely, we can, um, we, we have found some interesting results. Uh, what they've used is sorting of integers, which were in the range of zero to 255. And they've encoded these integers with different data types, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, and 64-bit unsigned integers. Okay, so that's what they used as data types. And then they've looked at different sorting algorithms. So the normal ones, bubble sort, insertion sort, quick sort, merge sort, Q sort, counting sort. Now they are all from, um, uh, so they differ in their complexity classes. Right, and so the the, the uh, comparison between these different uh, algorithms isn't really a fair comparison. Um, but what we wanted to know is how much can you do, um, and how much energy is consumed for a given number of elements. Right, so, and we compared this according to the encoding of the data, and now we can find interesting things. We can, for instance, see with the black square there, that insert insertion sort, the 32-bit version, uh, appears to be more optimized, right? So if we look at insertion sort, the 8-bit version, uh, in terms of total energy consumed, and that was obtained using ECOF, is 102, 103, 104, 105. But hang on, that wasn't 104, that was 98. So that's interesting to see that for some reason, um, this 32-bit encoding actually uses less energy than any of the others. Counting sort is interesting. 75% more energy is consumed for 64-bit compared to 8-bit values. So let's have a look at this. Uh, counting sort down here. We've got um, the 64-bit values and 
the 8-bit values. And there's a considerable change. Sorry, go back. There's a considerable change here um, in energy consumption. Uh, the values are the same, it's just the encoding, the data type uh, is different. And you can see that there is a lot more energy consumed um, for the 64-bit compared to the 8-bit version. And also, we see that sorting 64-bit values takes less time than sorting 8-bit values. Right? So if we look at uh, the resource consumption, we've got total time, total energy and average power. Uh, if we look at the time it takes, then it's interesting to see that the total time it takes for merge sort and queue sort to sort the 64-bit um, encoded values here, um, that goes faster than sorting the 8-bit values. But it consumed more energy. So the energy consumed when you sort the 64-bit values is higher than the energy consumed um, when you sort the 8-bit values. So we asked ourselves uh, what the cause of this might be. And uh, we discussed this with uh, various experts. And it turns out that uh, the extra, the 8-bit the, the, um, encoding um, has extra instructions um, that uh, make sure that only 8-bit are being uh, processed. And this setting up actually costs more time, but is less energy hungry because actually the, the, the bit width is reduced and therefore the energy consumed is actually a lot less. So uh, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because without energy transparency, we wouldn't have been able to um, see all of this. And it's really interesting because you can now look at um, the results. You can compare uh, different encodings. You can also look uh, for the different algorithms. And you can also see that average power um, varies quite a bit between the different algorithms too. Um, so that gives you a good insight. And that's the whole idea about transparency. Without this information, all you would have known about these algorithms is um, their computational complexity. And with this information, it becomes much more transparent as to how these algorithms use the computational resources. And it should be possible to install the ECOV uh, and, and effectively any uh, desktop uh, system. So there is an invitation for you. The ECOV is open source. Um, you can use it um, and you can contribute to it if you so wish. And, um, and uh, let me know how you're getting on. And I hope that that helps you become more energy efficient while you uh, write software as a first uh, approximation, right? As a first way of not having to put anything like this in place, not having to mess around with the hardware. And when you set the ECOV up, normally um, the end user instruments their code and it's usually um, well in your case probably will be you yourself uh, who deals with the providers but the providers on a particular platform only need to be done once right so where you get your energy data from only needs to be done once and then you can instrument all your code uh, and obtain interesting insights into how your code uses the computing platform okay so We have looked into how to measure the energy consumed uh, by software and uh, next I would like to um, look at how to construct energy consumption uh, models and how to estimate the energy consumed by software without measuring it. Okay, um, what I need to do now is I need to switch um, to a slightly different presentation because this presentation is actually quite large. So let me um, stop sharing for a moment and then come back again so that we can carry on at this point. And in the meantime, I perhaps look at uh, some of the questions as well that have come in. There are quite a few questions. Um, maybe we should have a look at them 
uh, before. So, uh, someone made a comment on ECOF, it's not been updated for quite a while. Uh, that's true. Um, this was a second year project, so the students have used it as they were second year students and they've graduated and have gone. Um, we've had a few people use it since then. Um, if anyone wants to and is interested in taking it further, by all means, uh, uh, let us know and we'll support you as much as we can um, with that endeavour. Um, it was insightful for us to see uh, what can be learned from, from uh, watching the energy consumed by the code that you write. Um, Carol um, has commented that Hard Kernel uh, has provided a, a board, the Odroid XU3, uh, which has um, clusters for A15s and uh, A7 cores. Um, and uh, I'm exactly aware of the problem that this is no longer produced. Um, there was an XU3 board uh, plus E as well that allowed you uh, direct access to energy measurement points on board. That was an excellent facility, but unfortunately I am not aware of anyone doing this at the moment. There is an XU4 board, but it doesn't allow you access to um, the energy as part of the board itself. So that is a real, real shame. I wonder whether one could do something as a community um, to have uh, boards or to put to put suggestions to hardware developers um, to allow the researchers and the software developers access to the energy consumed. Uh, and the XU3 uh, Odroid board was was an excellent board to do that. But unfortunately, I don't know any alternatives. We are searching for alternatives as well. They are effectively gold dust. So here's another question. Can we say that with the multitude of software languages available, determining the energy consumed by a processor running any software code, it will be comparatively easier to analyze the energy consumed in the hardware than the software? Um, that's an interesting question from Yaganath. Um, um, there are certainly a large number of software languages available and um, it is easier to determine the energy consumed at the machine code level um, and that is mainly because um, you can characterize at that level much easier and projecting that information up to the software developer is really turning out to be quite hard. Uh, because remember, you've got the source code, but in between the source code and the executable is the compiler. And the compiler, compiler actually has a lot of um, freedom to um, uh, optimize in many cases for performance. And performance optimization is good for energy, for saving energy. Um, uh, but, but, um, If I uh, characterize at the instruction level and I characterize an executable, then communicating back to the software developer at the source code level, which part of the source code is energy hungry and which part um, is green, is really, really difficult. Um, if you switch, however, to what you're suggesting, the hardware RTL uh, level rather than the software, um, I I, I, I think there is opportunity wasted if we just optimized uh, from the hardware side. Um, as we've seen in this, in this article from 1997, um, there is clear merit in software developers choosing algorithms wisely, knowing the impact that data encodings um, uh, and, and algorithms have on the energy consumed. So we can do a lot better if we include the top end, the software end of the system stack. Um, at the ISA, so at the architectural level, at the RTL level, a lot of opportunities already been realized. 
the challenge now is to push this, these savings up and to enable the software developers to make full use of that potential and to realize the extra potential that comes from um, from choosing the right algorithms and making sure it fits well with the uh, computational hardware. Um, if you think about it from a different point of view, if I choose a poor algorithm as a software developer and I leave it for the hardware to deal with, then the hardware can do as much as it can in terms of power efficient computing. But at the ISA level or the RTL level during system design, you haven't got a chance to make up for someone choosing the wrong algorithm. Okay, uh, because you just don't know what the problem is they're trying to solve. Whilst at the software level, the software developer, the system designer, uh, from the software perspective, they know what the problem is they want to solve. They know how they can encode the data. They can choose the bit width that is relevant for their uh, code. And therefore they have a large, um, uh, uh, a large number of options to play with. And uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, be able to realize the savings that are available there uh, if we just focused at um, the architectural and the RTL level. So this is what our research tries to do, to basically uh, empower the software developers um, by providing them with energy transparency so they can make choices more wisely and more informed choices. Okay, I'm going right to the bottom of the questions. Um, interesting activity to measure energy consumed for different algorithms. Um, that's from Kim Pettersen. Have you investigated how different settings of the compiler affect the results? Compilers are an extremely complicated piece of software and you can affect very much the changing values and different flags. Yes. Um, yes, uh, there's already an answer here. Um, I will look at this paper. I can't easily see what this paper is. Uh, we are conducting research into um, the use of compilers in this context as well and what the compilers can do. Um, Kim, I will uh, provide you with a more extensive um, answer offline um, in writing, but suffice it to say that compilers normally focus on, um, on, on performance. And uh, optimizations for energy, it is wise to first of all uh, optimize for performance. That's certainly wise to do. Um, but there are optimizations that you can't see uh, as, as when you just optimize for performance. Uh, a very insightful example that we stumbled across almost by accident uh, was uh, when a loop in a um, embedded program straddled, straddled between memory banks. Okay, so you had your loop and uh, we wanted to measure the energy consumed by the program. And sometimes it was actually seeming to be quite energy efficient and then other times it was not. And then we looked into this and it depended on where the code was placed uh, in memory. And this particular loop sometimes ended up on one memory bank and so as the program went through the execution, only one bank needed to be, to be powered on, okay? And that meant the overall energy consume, consumption was rel relatively low compared to the other option where this loop straddled two memory banks. And that meant you actually had to have two memory banks uh, working and uh, being powered on at the same time. And that was a noticeable difference in terms of energy consumption, although it had no impact at all on the runtime of the program. So there was no performance, observable performance difference between the two versions of the program. However, the placement of the loop in memory meant that sometimes more hardware was used and needed to be powered than um, uh, in other cases. Okay. And then by controlling this, by carefully placing loops so that they straddle as few boundaries as possible, uh, you can actually lower the energy consumed 
and again there is no uh, visible performance difference between these uh, programs. I hope that gives you an insight into um, uh, an example of a, an, an optimization that is energy uh, or power and energy specific uh, but not uh, visible when you just look for performance. In terms of compilers, um, it is interesting to see, uh, especially for LLVM, so most of our work is focused on LLVM, uh, and it is possible to see that there are significant differences uh, as the compiler goes through. Now, someone, uh, Vincent, has um, put um, uh, the standard optimization levels, 01, 02, 03, um, and uh, has, has noted that on most applications, it seems there is virtually no difference in power consumption between the different flags. Uh, our research shows uh, different. And uh, I can point you to a recent paper that uh, has, has just been accepted in the computer journal. I will uh, include that tomorrow if you're interested in what the compiler can do. Um, where we actually found that um, uh, by, by carefully choosing the sequences, uh, the optimization sequences that are part of the standard optimization levels, and potentially even finishing an optimization run prior to the end of the optimization pass, you can end up with code that is performance wise and also potentially space and energy wise uh, better than if you run through the entire optimization uh, sequence. And um, yes, I, if you are interested in this, then I can include um, a relevant paper um, for you to have a look at. In fact, there is a paper on archive that is entitled a Less is More that gives you an, an early indication um, of how this, this approach works. I hope this helps. And let me just make a note tomorrow to, to include some of that uh, if there is sufficient time. There is, of course, also uh, machine learning that has been used in this context. So there's a lot of research on machine learning being used in order to work out what the best compiler configuration is. Um, if you think about all the available flags in the compiler, then uh, two to the 100 or 150 is a large search space. And uh, there is machine learning research um, that investigates how one can fine tune a compiler uh, but remember, at the beginning of uh, the, the session, we looked at uh, the cost of training machine learning and um, that there is considerable uh, energy cost associated with this. So we are in Bristol are striving for uh, techniques that at the moment don't use um, uh, machine learning, but actually exploit what the compiler can do to start with. And much of this is... Um, not fully exploited um, as, as far as we can see. Yes, so if you found the paper, uh, all our papers are on archive. If you just say Kirsten Eder archive, you can see all the papers. Uh, the, the first paper on the compilers uh, was called uh, Less is More. And the most recent one that is going to appear in the computer journal very soon, uh, it's in press at the moment, is also on, on archive, that is called Lost in Translation. And hopefully that gives you a better idea as to what one can do when one uses a compiler um, more wisely than just using the standard optimization levels. Okay. Yes, someone made the comment that optimizing compilers uh, can consume a lot of power too. Uh, yes, so that is why we're saying really everything should come with an energy label, right? So that you can see whether this is worth your while or whether, um, or whether it, is, it is better to, to um, use a different approach uh, and, and um, 
ideally, ideally, I would like to see a situation where every software developer can see uh, what the tools they're using uh, consume in terms of energy and also what the code that they are creating is consuming in terms of energy. That would be my ideal world um, and that would be really nice. Okay, any further questions that we should answer now? Um, Here is an interesting one still uh, regarding software controls behavior. Um, um, I see hardware as the road and software as the traffic using the road. Uh, the most efficient way to make traffic uh, run more efficient is to extend the road. This is why we are adding more and more hardware around the process to make software overcome its inefficiency. How do you think about how do you think about that way to look at energy efficiency? Um, yeah, well, interesting. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether the problem can be solved by adding more hardware. I think we all need to become wiser. And the great gains that we've made by introducing the abstraction levels, I think many of them can be uh, bridged by us developing tools that, uh, that, that make use of the information available at a lower level and present this to the upper level. And that's exactly what our research is, is, is focused on, which is why we're doing this. So, you know, we need to proceed on both directions. Um, but I think at the moment we're wasting a lot of uh, potential on the software side. Okay. Are there any further questions that I can answer at this stage? I will look through later on as well. Um, Okay, so if we've got it um, almost three o'clock, um, if I give you a five minute break, not a scavenger hunt this time, but just a five minute break um, for you to uh, stretch your legs a bit and then um, I would quite like to have a look at some of the, if, if we want to get compilers in tomorrow, then I would quite like to have a look at some of the stuff that we are starting with tomorrow and give you a flavor of um, where we are going. Um, so I would quite like to, to have the first few slides from tomorrow already today. Okay, so I give you a five minute break um, and then we can come back for maybe another 10 or 15 minutes. So we gain a little bit of time in terms of fitting in some compiler stuff tomorrow. Okay.
Okay, so can I assume everyone is back here so we can um, carry on for a, a little while longer? We spent quite a bit of time looking through questions. Is that okay? Just tell me in the chat that you're back. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Great. Okay, I see you back. Um, right, so we're back to our learning objectives. We've looked at measuring the energy consumed by software, and I said we want to proceed to estimating the energy consumed by software without measuring it, right? Because measuring is difficult. We want to make sure that we don't have to do this. We don't need to take the soldering iron. We don't have to have special hardware. We want to enable people to gain an understanding of how this how much energy is consumed without having to measure it. And that naturally leads us to needing to construct energy consumption models, which is why this is also now in black uh, in terms of our learning objectives. Okay. So, static analysis of energy consumption. Um, I want to give you a, a, an introduction to the topic um, so that we gain a better understanding of what uh, is happening. And that leads me to my first encounter um, of static uh, resource analysis um, uh, as part of the Entra project. That was our first uh, project where we looked at whole systems energy transparency. It was a fantastic uh, research project that lasted three years. And um, it was a future and emerging technologies project which started in 2012. And it had as a focus software models and programming methodologies supporting the strive for the energetic limit. Okay, so that's really interesting as a, as a goal. Uh, energy cost awareness, exploiting the trade off between energy and performance and precision. We were a small project, there was only four partners um, with. Uh, uh, Ross Kilder University leading the project and specializing in program transformation uh, in their uh, software leading the research on uh, analysis. The University of Bristol leading the research in energy measurement and modeling and Exmos, a local semiconductor design company uh, in Bristol who provided us with hardware. Now we focus on the Exmos X-Core because the Exmos X-Core is fully timing predictable. Okay, and that basically means you can statically analyze how long an XMOS X core program uh, is uh, taking during execution. And we thought we start with such a simple processor because if we can't energy characterize that one, we might as well leave our uh, um, pack our bags and go and, and do something else instead, right? So we start with something really simple and it turned out to work really beautifully. Okay, so I said we wanted to look at static resource uh, consumption analysis. Um, well, for energy consumption, we thought we're going to adapt traditional resource usage analysis techniques um, and use energy consumption as the target resource. Uh, these techniques automatically infer upper and lower bounds on energy usage of a program. And these bounds are nicely expressed using arithmetic functions per unit that you analyze. So for instance, per, per procedure or function. And these are parameterized by the program's input size, for instance. And then you can perform verification statically by checking that the upper and lower bounds on the energy usage or generally the resource usage um, uh, that are uh, observed are actually matching those in the specification. Now, this is quite a mouthful. Let me visualize this for us, okay? So, assuming we have a resource on the y-axis, a resource that might be energy, that might be time, um, and we have on the x-axis the input data size, okay? Then SU and SL is the specified upper bound and a specified lower bound in terms of my resource usage. Okay, so I'm specifying a corridor, uh, this pink corridor, where I'm saying, okay, um, that is where I want my program to be in terms of its resource usage. Okay, so that's my specification. Then I write the program and I apply 
an analysis to it. And this analysis returns an analysis result. Here it is. Okay. So the analysis returns this blue corridor. Okay. And this blue corridor comes with an upper bound and a lower bound and gives us this nice overlap with the uh, pink corridor, uh, giving us some sort of lilac or purple. Okay. And now I said with these two uh, available to us, we can perform verification. Uh, we can indeed perform verification. If we look at verification, then it's clear that there are some areas, some properties of the input data size where my analysis result meets the specification. So my specification is uh, satisfied and I consider my program correct. There are other areas where I'm clearly outside my specification, right? Look at this first part here, the leftmost part. That's clear that the resource usage over that um, uh, area is clearly higher than what the specification expects, right? So what I've specified. And on the rightmost side, you can also see there is an area there where my specification uh, allows for higher but my analysis result is clearly lower, okay? So again, on those two areas, I have not satisfied my specification. So um, I get an incorrect program in terms of its resource usage. The resource usage um, from the analysis doesn't meet the specification. And then there are these other middle areas where sometimes I'm meeting the specification and sometimes I don't. Right? So these are the areas of unknowns. Okay? And um, that's exactly what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to have an expectation. We want to be able to express that expectation in terms of constraints, in terms of easily understandable constraints, perhaps you know, in terms of battery life. And then for the system to analyze um, the actual code that we write, possibly different options that we offer the system, and then we can see which one of those actually meets our specification. Or if we actually end up with something like this, we can say, okay, as long as I keep my input properties, in this case, the input data size in the corridor where I get my verification to say, yes, I'm meeting the specification, as long as I'm not going outside this, then I'm fine operating in these, within these constraints. As soon as I drop to the left or drop to the right, I go into unknown territory, but it is important for my resource usage uh, expectations to be met that I make sure the input data size is constrained within um, the corridor that is down there under verification in uh, green um, stated as correct. Okay, so there are different implications from such a uh, analysis and it's fantastic that we can actually use static analysis and verification to gain an insight into how uh, things work. Okay, so now how does static resource analysis work? We've got a little program here on the left hand side. Um, it's a factorial program, really simple. Um, we've got an integer x, we make a comparison on that integer x, we compare it to zero, we return one if x is less or equal to zero, um, and otherwise we go into a recursive call where we times x by um, the return value from a call to a factorial uh, with x being decremented. Okay, so that shouldn't be um, difficult for anyone who is in the audience, I would expect. Um, tell me if you find this difficult, then we'll have to... Um, uh, talk about this. Um, and what we want to do, as I said, when we looked at, remember at, earlier today, we looked at um, the back of the rail ticket um, in Italy, where we had different destinations and different means of transport and the CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, and I said at that time that really we want to have energy consumption functions rather than single values. Okay, so in order to get functions, um, I um, proceed in analyzing the original program uh, to extract what is called cost relations. So let me talk you through these cost relations, okay? So if I want to know how much it costs uh, to call factorial um, with a given value x, 
then that is uh, the cost of uh, the comparison, which is labeled here with A, so that's the cost of the comparison A, plus the cost of the return B, where I'm returning one, provided that X is less or equal to zero. The cost of a quarter factorial is the cost of the comparison plus the cost of the recursive call if x is greater than zero. Now, what's the cost of the recursive call? Well, the cost of the recursive call is the cost of the multiplication plus the cost of the actual recursion, right? So um, I should perhaps have said the cost of the return, right? So that's the cost of the return and that return uh, expression is composed of uh, the multiplication here uh, plus the cost of the actual uh, call to factorial again. Okay, so with these extracted cost relations, I can now substitute and find the cost for the comparison, the cost for the return, and the cost for uh, that multiplication. And uh, with, with the actual values, right? So I need to characterize the computation with the actual energy required to execute the corresponding machine instructions to um, run this program, okay? And once I've substituted this, um, I can solve those cost relations and I should get an energy consumption function, okay? So the cost relations can be converted into what is called closed form. So there are no recurrences left using off-the-shelf solvers such as POPs. I've included a POPs um, uh, reference for you to, if you wanted to have a look at this. And that would then result in an energy consumption function, okay? Any questions so far? Does this all make sense? None so far? Relating to this? This all looks simple, right? Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite so simple because um, in order to be able to do this, let me just go one slide back. In order to be able to do this, I need to work out these costs and that turns out to not be trivial. Okay, it turns out not to be trivial because um, these, what we are seeing here is source code. Whilst um, uh, in order to be able to do this, I typically do the extraction of the cost relations um, at a lower level of abstraction where I can actually substitute these values in. So imagine we had uh, used a compiler and the compiler would have produced a corresponding um, uh, uh, machine code uh, uh, fragment for this uh, factorial uh, function. And then I extract the cost relations that are associated with that machine code. Then in that case, if I have an add, a subtract, a multiply, a load and a store, then I can perhaps find out how much it costs um, uh, to execute an add, a subtract, a multiply and a store. Then I can substitute in and then the solvers can give me my cost relation. Okay, so this turns out to not be quite as simple as it might look. Okay, so In order to carry on with our analysis, we first need to jump into the construction of energy consumption models, okay? And this is what we're going to do next. And I think at this point, perhaps we shall stop for today and carry on uh, tomorrow. Um, suffice it to say that very pretty pictures that come out of energy modeling. Uh, we've made some pictures um, and uh, uh, we found them aesthetically pleasing. Um, be interesting to see what you think of these. Uh, for tomorrow, I would like us to be able to look at a piece of assembly code just in the way I just uh, explained. And I'd like to, before we close, have a final poll. Uh, this one here um, to see 
what your reaction is to this. Um, I would like to know whether you're happy to read and interpret a basic small machine code program. Uh, for instance, the one that would be associated with that uh, factorial function. Because that will help us uh, perform some energy consumption analysis um, manually to start with. That's brilliant. Um, really nice result. 68% um, of you have voted um, and there's a large number of you who are happy to do this, which I'm very pleased to see. So tomorrow we will need that skill, exactly that skill, um, because in that case I can send you, set you um, a, little, a little test of your understanding uh, rather than me doing it for you and you watching. It's always much more fun to do that yourself. Great, so let me share this poll. Um, it's obvious that you're all comfortable with this. Um, so tomorrow get your skills sharpened up, uh, a bit of basic assembler um, and machine code, and we will use that in order to determine with pencil and paper the energy consumed by a very small assembler program. Okay, um, so let me stop sharing this and I think um, I'm going to have another look at the questions that have come in. There's nothing that has come in on the static analysis so far. Um, it's another question that I have. Uh, perhaps, um, Eniko, could you do a poll on who has seen the worst case execution time or the uh, run the real-time analysis by Tulio. that would be interesting to see because that will tell me how much of this uh, will will perhaps have already been understood um, and how much of this I, I need to get into in detail. Um, is that possible to do? I would basically like to know how many of you have participated in Tullio's um, course on, on real-time computing and, and, and static worst-case execution time analysis, um, and how many have not. Okay, so I've just seen the chat. Uh, we can't update uh, the polls live. Um, let me see, maybe it's there. No, let me get rid of this again and try again. Is up? No. Okay, so we do this tomorrow morning, uh, or tomorrow when we start again. Um, if you have seen that course i'd be interested in in how many of you are comfortable with that material if you've seen it and it was a bit uh, strange then uh, we certainly will go over the material again but it, it gives me an idea as to what what uh, your understanding is on that front okay let me see again whether there are any further questions none at the moment um okay then i shall leave you with these energy modeling pictures and this is exactly where we will start tomorrow. Thank you very much um, for uh, all your questions. It's been a great pleasure to um, talk to you and to engage with you. Thanks for answering all the polls. And I see that um, we've actually got quite an interesting lot here in terms of the mix of CS and E. And I hope you will learn a little bit about how we can give more power to the software developers because there's a lot of power that the hardware designers can save. I want the software developers to save even more. All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow.